I'm quite happy to be here uh, presenting on this uh, topic because I'm very interested in myself for one anyways. And I'd like to welcome uh, Tom Curran on board who's uh, commenced uh, working uh, with me in this area. So one will hear more about Tom in the next few years. Um, I think, uh, you know, in, when we look at uh, collaborative farming, um, Pat uh, Bogue uh, in his last session there, he really delved into the background of it and the uh, need for it and I just set out a few headlines here of areas I think where collaborative farming would mean an awful lot to farmers so I won't go down through them because Pat really highlighted those areas in his presentation. I think uh, uh, within uh, Chagas when we look at uh, collaborative farming there and nationally there are three well recognised types of collaborative farming that are up and running for some time here in Ireland namely we're talking about uh, partnerships in a formalised sense, contract rearing, share farming and in each of those uh, there are uh, specimen agreements and taxation issues have been cleared and I think matters with the Department of Agriculture as regards uh, the, all the supports, uh, they're fairly clear on all those arrangements. So um, I think uh, for the audience here we have quite a mixture of people in the audience here, solicitors and accountants and advisors and consultants and auctioneers. I think you know, we all uh, in our own uh, areas deal with clients around the country and I think in our own way what we're really trying to do with, when we're dealing with farmers is trying to meet their needs in terms of giving them good professional advice and assistance and I think the, uh, one of the big areas that's been highlighted here by Pat Bogue is, is going forward and there's more ways than one I think of dealing with land that people own and what's really important is it gets into good productive use and that the clients who own it uh, find ways in which uh, if there are other collaborative ways of doing what have you which I'm going to go through that you're aware of them and at least uh, you'd have a general awareness and if nothing else uh, that you'd know where to direct your client to because I think when you look for there's an opportunity here to, obviously for all of us too I think you know we're living in a commercial world and we have to charge fees and what have you and I think um, in um, any happy client going away it's easier to get money from a happy client than an unhappy one. So uh, partnerships if we move on from there I suppose in general uh, when we look at any type of uh, arrangements um, most people like to look at keeping it reasonably simple. Uh, just three main highlights I do uh, set out here in rela relation to partnerships. One is Everybody knows, you know, anyone going into any kind of a, uh, uh, of a, if you like, collaborative arrangement, particularly a partnership, because it's so cl closely, uh, uh, you know, combining partners in the way they operate, you need compatible people. And, and for the partners to operate that prop properly, obviously, you need a very clear arrangement. You know, it goes with the argument. Otherwise, the, uh, you know, you're going to lead towards the possibility of disputes and misunderstandings. And the third one, I think, is, uh, having uh, an understanding verbally is not great. You need it needs to be something as serious. This needs to be committed to writing, and and this is where I think professions need to be very careful. Is that if farmers are getting involved in, for example, a partnership, it's very important that the partners understand what's in their agreement. It's very understand. It's very important that they take ownership of it. Now I contend that that can only happen if they're involved in the drawing up of that agreement. So it's not a question of going to a professional and, and do, a professional doing up an agreement, going home, putting it in the filing cabinet and not knowing what's in it. So I think that is something that, so it's all about preparation. Uh, in, the, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a partnership, I think, you know, it's really, it's a business. Um, farming, I suppose, as a business, it's different to other types of businesses, isn't it? And when you look at farming, look at the assets involved. There's land, there's buildings, livestock, machinery, and so on, right? And then you have a plethora of EU legislation that Andy was talking about earlier, and we'll see how complex that is. And, that's a, and he was only talking about the, uh, you know, the direct payments. But then there's grants, there's uh, compliance issues, uh, and, 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 a, and a plethora of other schemes. And then, of course, we know that farming is different. We have a lot of accountants here, and it's different from a taxation point of view. A lot of special provisions for farmers. So all of those have to be taken into account if somebody is going into a partnership agreement. And I think, really, um, 
I would view, um, I suppose a lot of people could view a, a partnership, a farm partnership, as a modified partnership as opposed to what you could describe as a full partnership. And what I mean by a full partnership is if people are in a partnership where all the assets are jointly owned by the partners. And that wouldn't work too well, I think, in a farming partnership. Because in a part farming partnership, you look at the assets. The normal setup uh, for most people who go into farming partnership is, as you many people would be aware, is that uh, many of the assets are kept in the individual ownership of the partners. And namely, I'm talking about land, the buildings that are brought into the partnership, entitlements and quota. If you think of all of those as assets, they would normally be kept in the, in the individual ownership of the partners. So if the, if the partnership terminates, there's no discussion about those assets. However, because it's an operating business, some assets would need to be owned by the partnership, and normally you're talking about the livestock and machinery and working capital. And as, as, as anyone who uh, has any, um, I suppose, exposure to setting up partnerships or helping people, the, um, the, the uh, livestock and machinery is really, the, they're the assets that the partners will invest in the partnership. It's the equity that people put in. And really with that, it's really important, I think, in setting up the partnership, because there's really a couple of professions really come into this. There's obviously the advisory, there's the accounting, and there's the legal. And, and this is the accounting side of it, isn't it? About you know, what assets are brought in, what value is put on those assets, and that there's a proper capital account kept in the partnership. Because the day the partnership is set up, really, is the day it's decided how you're going to terminate it. And if it's set up properly, then, and the account's properly signed off every year, it becomes a lot easier to terminate any partnership. So, um, that, I was just talking about partnerships in general there, but we do have what was introduced there about 10 years ago, registered partnerships in Ireland, they're called milk production partnerships. Now that name will be changing in the near future because the power partnership, um, registered partnerships, um, the intention is that they're going to be expanded into non-dairying areas also, so that non-dairy farmers will be able to do registered partnerships. The number of these registered partnerships called milk production partnerships at the moment are, are, are under register. 664 as I speak around the country. You have a map there of distribution and of course you see they're more densely populated in the southern counties because it has to do with uh, daring as much as anything else. And you might say what is a milk production partnership in MPP? It's, it has to be on a register. That register is currently maintained by Chagas. I, I manage that register as part of my work. And uh, for a partnership to be uh, recognised, milk production partnership, it has to hold a certificate of registration. And that's the ticket that is, you know, and anyone who's dealing with it in any section of the Department of Agriculture or anywhere else where it's relevant, uh, they will look for a copy of that certificate. Um, so that distinguishes these partnerships that come up to a certain standard. It's not just any partnership. Now, you wonder why people go into partnerships. There's obviously a lot of potential personal benefits, and I'll deal with that in a minute, between the partners themselves. But outside the partnership, there are benefits coming. And if you look at the various uh, EU department schemes, REPs and EAS schemes, where you get individual partner farmers into partnership, they're each recognised as individuals, and you can get a multiple of the payments. Dairy equipment scheme grants, there's up to three times the grant can be claimed for eligible partners in the partnership, access to milk quota, individually treatment, and so on. I, 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 I'll uh, keep moving on on this. On taxation, we have accountants here. There are special provisions here also for the registered partnerships under taxation. For example, income averaging. Normally in a partnership, if a farmer is on income averaging and uh, as an individual sole trader and go into partnership, they have to cease uh, uh, income averaging. There's a provision in the Finance Act they are brought in for the milk production partnerships. Stock relief, and you'll hear that in the next session, there's a provision brought in there for enhanced stock relief for people who are in a registered partnership. Uh, as regards the revenue commissions, for example, say capital allowances, buildings, farmer brings buildings into the partnership. I said earlier, the buildings, when you're setting up a partnership, the buildings normally wouldn't be owned by the partnership. They're individually owned, but it's the partnership that's trading. So if there's outstanding capital allowances on the buildings, the revenue will allow uh, the unused capital allowances to be used by that partner in the partnership. They're not lost. Likewise, there's provisions there for expenses raised by an individual partner by virtue of the fact that they're par uh, farming. Capital gains tax is a provision under capital gains tax there where there's joint ownership of land. 
On their other taxes there, they say capital acquisition tax and stamp duty, if someone's in a partnership, they're treated by revenue as farming, so they have all the provisions there and they're qualified for all the provisions. That there's a special provision for the milk production partnerships whereby if a farmer was farming res for VAT before going into the partnership on entering the partnership, they don't have to discontinue the register for VAT, right? So the revenue uh, have always been very much on board for the registered partnerships and that's obviously going to continue into the future. Just to put a face on some of these partnerships. Well, in uh, this case here, it's uh, four family members in a partnership. Um, there's Stephen and Ivan, uh, two sons, uh, Winston the father, and Ina the wife. She wasn't here for the picture. It's a family partnership down near Mitchellstown. I'm just putting this up here as a sample, right? This partnership, four partners, as I said, uh, two parents, two sons. There's two farms involved. One of the sons owns a farm. The, par the f parents own a farm. The second son owns some land, but was never set up separately as a farmer. In total, they own 152 acres, hectares, uh, 220 cows, and they're producing one and a half million litres of milk, and they divide the profits on an equal basis. You might ask, why did they set up the partnership, or uh, you know, why are they in the partnership? Well, um, you know, what they would certainly say to you is that by operating together as a family, they're paying no labour, they're all involved in it, um, and um, they, um, they're growing the business together, and growing it they are. Um, for example, you know, just a picture there of the um, buildings, the uh, top building there that houses all the uh, cows, the 20 cows, it includes a milk and parlour, the bottom pictures there gives a, an insight view. Um, that's really set up to run, it's a big operation. They're making good money obviously and uh, they're growing the business together rather than, than, than uh, uh, doing it separately. Like, um, and, and in the running of the business together, like the way it happens in practice here, just a few snippets out of it, I was out with him there a few weeks ago, each partner is responsible for his own chores. You know, so it's like they're running as a business, the, the responsibilities are divided up. Like the typical morning there at the moment, because they do autumn calving, for example, is they're up there, um, they have the cows in, milking at seven o'clock in the morning. They finish the milking, uh, one and a half hours, wash up and all, and they're in for a breakfast at half eight. And the breakfast is, it's a walking breakfast, as they would describe it to me, where they would, uh, you know, discuss days, chores ahead, plan ahead, what they're going to do, and sometimes, in fact, it could become extended depending on the situation. And just then, you have individual responsibilities where each partner, for example, live in one of the sons, handles all the management records, his financial records, he's good at that. Stephen, the other son, he looks after the animal registrations for the department, breeding records, vaccines, etc. And then, you know, as regards a lot of the practical stuff at farm level, that can be interchangeable. So, um, moving on, just a couple of quotes. As I was talking to him, I wanted to take a couple of photographs, and I, I thought worthwhile taking down a few quotes, and this, they just came out of it. Farming can be lonesome life, it's hell on your own. I've heard that so often with, from dairy farmers, because it's 24-7, isn't it? Uh, Stephen, one of the sons, wouldn't have had time to socialise if he wasn't in a partnership. His girl lives, I think, about 100 miles away, but he seems to get a good bit of time to go there, right? And it's easy going uh, on the holidays because you don't have to worry about the business. You know that he's in capable hands. Again, you hear that over and over and over from people in partnerships. Anyone dealing with farmers, dairy farmers, go on holidays, they're on the phone, so many times, how are things going? And I've come across farmers who terminate their partnership early because uh, something unforeseeable happened. Just another example here, if that's okay. Uh, here's two neighbours in a partnership in Kilworth in Cork, there, uh, North Lansing, Michael Nonan. They're standing in front of their uh, milking parlour, the one that's operational now. They, they were next door neighbours, commenced partnership in 2006. They're currently milking 135 cows, producing 8,000 8, 8, uh, litres of milk. Cows are kept on a combined 69 acre block of land around the parlour. Some of that land is, you know, is separately owned by the partners because their next door neighbours were able to join it like that. They also have some out, land, out farms where they keep other animals. Both are working full time. Both are married with families. One of them has uh, family school-going kids, uh, the other has um, some in university and uh, qualified. Uh, 
uh, the division of profits here, it's not on a 50-50 basis, it's uh, 42-58. And you wonder how did they end up with that? They brought, got some professional advice. They talked to their consultant and their, uh, their solicitor was involved and their accountant as well. But they ended up with that with outside help in, in working it out on the basis of what assets each of them brought towards the arrangement. Um, it took a little bit of working through, but you know, y usually you won't end up with a 50-50 in a family or in a, a neighbouring situation. I asked at the end, before I left them, I said, what is, uh, you know, what's your plans for the future? Like, you're doing 135 cows. And both of them looked at me and said, well, we don't plan on really getting at any more cows. Lifestyle is what we're after in this partnership. You know, we're making good money. That's what they said back to me. Well, what, you know, when I teased them a little bit more, they said it might increase by up to 45, 50 cows, but they would concentrate on maybe better milk yields and better quality milk and stuff like that to increase their profits there. So this partnership is about lifestyle. It, you know, it's the big driver of this partnership. And, and as an example of that, say during calving time, which is January to March, it's a 24-7 job there. They, uh, during that period, no time off, no weekends off, all hands on deck. They employ no labor, right? So, uh, so there's no expense in that regard. But for the balance of the year then, uh, they take uh, half day on Friday, back half day Monday. Well, there's not many of us in this room doing that, right? And there are not too many farmers in the country doing it, but they can do it because they're in partnership, right? So, um, and they would maintain that they, you know, their farm is going to be uh, sustainable into the future, into the next generation, because there's a life there. Um, they set out, just for a practical point of view, set out their divide their day-to-day -day responsibilities, and that is set out in a non-farm agreement. That makes it very clear, and they visit that, revisit that every so often, and amend uh, the situation there. Uh, the last slide I have on them here, and there's two a couple of messages on this slide here I'd like you to take from it. On the left-hand side of this uh, slide, you see office there. That's absolutely fundamental in a partnership, and particularly a non-family partnership, where one divides family life from the business, right? And sometimes we think of uh, family businesses can be troublesome, right? And that is because everything gets, can get intertwined with family life. But if you separate them, and this is so fundamental here, and part of it would be is that the office would never be in someone's house. You keep it outside. You do the business outside the personal uh, places of, of uh, living and so on. On the right-hand side here, the, um, the two top photographs there, it's just a, it just demonstrates that when two people set up a partnership, you have to make some changes at farm level. At the top one there, the two lads, Michael and um, Noel, they are walking on the, on the farm roadway. That's a piece of extra roadway to put in to link their two farms, to link the existing roadways. And they would have had to change paddocks. The middle photograph there on the right, it's about... Um, the, the, it's the parlour where they milk the cows. Now, when, before the start of the partnership, it's Michael Noonan's parlour, right? And uh, that, that uh, parlour there, it was a 10-unit parlour. Now they had a much bigger herd of cows and put all the cows together. So what they did was they cannibalised Noel's parlour, put in four units here at a small cost, brought up to 14 units. In fact, they're bringing up to 16 units now. So that's the practicalities of the kind of things you, you people do, I suppose, going into a partnership. And of course, they, the last the bottom photograph there speaks for itself, doesn't it? It's about family life. It's just a different type of arrangement here, contract rearing, and this is something we see a great potential for in the country and growth, especially in the whole expansion of dairy farming. And um, really, it's, um, you know, it's a contract, a simple contract from a legal point of view, obviously. So that when uh, to, uh, the owner here would refer to a dairy farmer and the contract rearer to someone who'd rear their replacement animals and rear them up to two years of age uh, uh, at the point of coming down, uh, you know, calving down. And this type of arrangement is a simple contract, but you'd say, you know, any of these arrangements obviously will only work if they're win-win situations. So in this one here, the dairy farmer, what's in it for the dairy farmer? A release of land for dairy production. Remember the issues that Pat was bringing up about farm size and all that kind of thing? Uh, it frees up labour to specialise more in dairy. Because you're ra if you rationalise any business and can streamline work, there's savings there, and that's what you're doing here. And it uh, might suit people where, uh, you know, where uh, your buildings, farm buildings cost money, you bring another farm into the arrangement which you'd be doing here, you're, you're, you're getting benefit of extra farm buildings. What's in it for a contract rearer? Well, for a contract rearer, you see, if you're not a dairy farmer, 
you think if you're, uh, we don't, they don't get their monthly uh, check, right, from their salary because they don't have a salary. So uh, instead of doing beef, for example, a farmer, if he's doing rearing replacements, he's insured of a monthly check from the dairy farmer, a payment from the dairy farmer for the work done, and that's the way it works. Uh, risk associated with fluctuation of uh, prices is eliminated as well. No money tied up in livestock. Like we're all dealing with farmers here. Sometimes someone inherits land and pack, give an example, I think earlier too, of uh, someone who maybe inherits land. No money. Can't get money from the bank. What's going to do with the land? What good, what good is 100 acres if you can't finance the development of it and the running of it uh, and make something useful? So this uh, kind of a, could be a solution as an example there where someone has the skills. On the Chagas website, we have a, a couple of um, uh, specimen agreements there for anybody who'd want them. Again, uh, there's a, one is a flat, based on flat rate payments monthly on the basis of per animal, and the other has got the bonus payments uh, tied up. They're just two examples of contracts. The kind of things that go into a contract, I would just highlight a couple of things here for, for illustration purposes. Um, you're talking about, you know, who and stuff needs to be written down on paper. We all appreciate that in this room here. I think who owns the animals, right? That has to be clear. Uh, the cost borne by the contract rear and the owner, that has to be decided, right? The, and again, the responsibilities of each party. What about animal losses? Uh, and so on and so forth. Um, look, I'll, we'll just move on there. To put, again, to put, a, I suppose, a practical example here. Here's two farmers there, um, almost next door neighbours down in Clonakilty. Robert Shannon there on the uh, left, he's a dairy farmer. And uh, the other, Anastasia Donahue Healy and Tyke Healy, husband and wife there, they're the contract rearers. Now, they're doing contract rearing there. Um, it's a, you know, it's not a huge farm. Not, they're, they're rearing in April out there. We were out there. Uh, this year, the 93 animals uh, being reared on contract. There's a monthly uh, payment done by standing order. The animals in this situation, and, and generally would remain in the ownership of the dairy farmer, were entered into the uh, other person's, the herd keeper, if you like, uh, the, the uh, contract rear's herd number, and, um, and so on, right? That's that. Uh, the, in that situation, the, um, uh, the farmer, the contract rear, has outside interests as well, so it's not the only source of income into the farm, but making really good use of the land and um, to, to, to the benefit of all. Uh, just a, a different example here, and it's just an unusual one. Um, it's uh, someone near Mitchelton, Michael Barry. He's actually doing contract rearing for four people. Now, that potentially opens up uh, issues of uh, disease and stuff like that, risk, uh, but it, it so happens his land is this, uh, you know, in different places, right? He has out farms, and uh, it's generally the good advice to be someone in that type of arrangement that only be rearing for one person, and it's the simple way of doing it. That's slightly more complicated, but all the people here seem to be involved and are doing it for the last five years, so uh, nothing happened yet. If we're going to the third type of arrangement here, if that's okay, are we doing okay time-wise, yeah? Okay, share farming, it's again, it's a, share farming, I suppose it's a relatively new concept here in Ireland. I think if we look abroad, it's been practiced very widely in New Zealand called share milking, it's to do with you know, uh, uh, sh uh, share milking. It will be used, I think, traditionally very, uh, very much so as share cropping in places like the US and Australia and South Africa and places like that, right? Fundamentally, there is no legislation, obviously, to cover share farming here. It's not like uh, partnership. If you, you, you have in partnership or legislation there, right? At least the Par Partnership Act and other uh, EU legislation under the milk quota regulations at the moment. Now, uh, for, for share farming, it needs to be done out very clearly in a contract, right? And there is a specimen agreement on the Chagas website again. But fundamentally what it is, is really two people who are farming on the same area of land, right? And it's set out and done in such a way that what the individuals divide is the produce. So if you take an example of, uh, uh, you have uh, 50 acres there and they're growing uh, barley on it. The produce from that, which is the barley and the straw, that's divided on some agreed base between the parties. And each party would also cover certain costs, individual costs, in such a way that each person has a certain stream of income 
at certain individual costs and each separately work out their own profit, right? That's how it differs from a partnership. It's a partnership to be all one business, one set of accounts, and one profit, you divide the profit. So obviously in the setting up of share farming is fundamentally as set up properly and managed properly so that people wouldn't inadvertently end up in a partnership, right? So to give you an example here, 40 hectares, land, right? Spring barley is growing on it. You have the landowner. Now this landowner, he, he uh, draws his single payments and reps, he owns those, he takes responsibility, he draws from the department, fills in and so on. Um, he, uh, by agreement, let's say, covers 100% of the seed and fertilizer costs, and he keeps 50% uh, of the, in, of the or sorry, covers 50% of the other inputs, the other costs, like, um, uh, uh, what would you call it, sprays and stuff like that, right? Now, the share farmer, he's the person who will come in and do the work. He provides the, uh, the labor, the machinery. He's really good equipment, this guy. He's a bigger operator. He provides the labor and, of course, expertise, right? Maybe the landowner mightn't have had as good of expertise, so there's a plus here. And, of course, he covers the other 50% of the input costs, EO, apart from machinery. On the output side, the landowner, let's look at the landowner. The landowner, he, let's say he keeps all his single farm payment. But in the agreement, he decides to share half the uh, rep's uh, payment here, right? So he gives half it to the other guy, right, to the share farmer that's in the agreement, and he keeps 100% of the straw, right? Uh, the share farmer obviously then ends up with half the reps, which is shared with the other guy and has the other portion of the grain. So if you like, you see on each side here, under the share farmer, his own set of incomes here, is that right? and own set of costs, individually work out his own profit, likewise with the other person. Now that's recognized by the revenue, it's, uh, um, it, 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 and it's very clear if it's uh, set out uh, as to how it operates. What's in this, you might say, for the landowner? Well, it certainly retains individual status as a farmer, both under the uh, Department of Agriculture and under uh, revenue rules, okay? Um, the on-farm benefits is the ones that farmers would really see. It gives access here to the landowner to improve management leading to better margins. So, you know, if better, 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 you know, if he's going in an uh, arrangement with someone who's very good. Reduce investment costs in machinery. You know, it may well be, in this case here, uh, you know, if there's uh, 40 hectares of barley, there wouldn't be much scope there to be invest much in machinery. Wouldn't that be right? And it frees up time if that's what that landowner wanted. Um, what's in it for the share farmer? Well, in increased scale of operation, certainly uh, by taking on, getting involved in these arrangements, uh, uh, you know, it will certainly justify the investment in machinery by having a bigger scale, uh, sharing of risk. Rather than going down a route of taking land on Conacre, uh, this arrangement allows the sharing of risk rather than paying a big price for Conacre and taking all the risk, and is a ladder of ent entry for new entrants, of course. Important principles, and these ones, both from a legal and accounting point of view, is important to take note of. In share farming, they cannot, you cannot have rent paid or fixed payments for the land, right? Otherwise, it would be construed as a rental arrangement. Each can sell their produce as they feel, feel, uh, as they feel uh, fit, right? Now, it's possible to make an arrangement with them where one person would sell the other person's produce on their behalf and just refund them the money. Each is responsible for their own costs. So they're really operating as sole traders, as separate individuals, and each work at their own profit, fundamental. And to facilitate that to work, and this is really important, and if, if you're dealing with farmers to get the right message, you don't go there with joint bank accounts at all, or you don't go there with joint merchant accounts, because then you could be moving in the direction of partnerships, okay? Keep everything separate, and uh, it's important that the partners see themselves as business equals, right? How is, a part of, how is one day's share farming set up, right? Well, fundamentally, I suppose each party, they'll need to uh, you work out a budget, see what kind of a crop or what they're going to produce or whatever, and how long it'll last for. There's a calculator then on the Chagas website, for example, of working out, uh, you know, uh, working out what the margin of a crop would be and how to share, uh, you know, if they share the produce in a certain portion and uh, share the cost in a certain portion, then you end up with a certain margin for each person. And, um, you know, that, uh, that's a to facilitate people to put their agreement together. 
obviously each person will have individual responsibilities. It's important that all of that is tied up in a proper legal agreement and they implement it according to the agreement. And then there shouldn't be any, because as far as the revenue is concerned, and my understanding on the Department of Agriculture as far as they're concerned, if it is implemented as in the specimen agreement is on the Chagas website, well, that, that's acceptable, okay? Okay, just to, uh, put a, the last picture I have here of people in one, uh, these arrangements, here's two farmers here, Liam Halpin uh, is, a share far, or is a share farmer with William Carey, they're in County Loud, right, he's the landowner. In their arrangement, the William Carey there, he owns 35 hectares, that's all of his land, that's in share farming, and the reasons why he gave for going into the share farming are his own machinery had clapped out, poor machinery, right? So his options were to get contractors in to the job or get into share farming. By getting into share farming, the other guy had uh, ownership in there in terms of you know, interest in having a good crop. He had uh, done some part-time work with the farmer so uh, that he got into arrangement with, so they knew one another. That was a great start. Lack of scale. He didn't have scale. Happy to be involved, but not at the coal phase. And there's a lot of farmers like that, and let's be, uh, face it, as a practical one, and, and as both accountants and solicitors must be coming across them all the time, where you have someone and they want to scale back, right? Because they're getting a bit older or they're starting up, or they haven't got the finance, or whatever the reason being. And, uh, you know, and this will be an example of something where someone might be very happy to be involved in the overall decisions and management, but uh, can't be in there. And no successor. This farm owner is obviously not interested in building up a resource for the next generation because there isn't a successor. And the other person then, Liam uh, Halpenny here, the share farmer, uh, he's farming a total of 200 hectares of his own tillage farmer. He's in three share farming arrangements and the total area on our share farming is 60. The reasons he gave were scale, more scale, it's important going forward. We have a problem here with land structure ownership. Uh, scale is an issue there. His way of growing his business, get, ri to get rid of the uncertainty of Conacre. Conacre is the greatest curse ever. Everybody says it. And, and they, he can spend money on improving soil fertility. And that's back to the Conacre one again. For anyone who's producing anything on land, if you only have it for a year and you don't know where it goes the next year, it takes five years to build up full, proper fertility with lime and phosphorus and so on. So it's, you're talking about overall, if people are in Conacre situation, you're really talking about land, as we know, that's underproductive. We're nearly there, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think aids to developing any of those agreements, you know, and we're all in the business of far trying to help farmers, their sp uh, specimens agreements are on the Chagas website, right? There's uh, calculators there to help in even working out the details there for anyone who is assisting at that level. And uh, there's information and guides there, and there's clearly tax publications there, and tax is important and again, and I think we have really good clarity on the whole tax end of it. So I think farmers going into those arrangements, if they want to go into them, and if you're leading them into it, I think you can put a lot of stuff in front of them with certainty. Uh, that is, if the two people or three people are right who go into the arrangement. And my very last slide here, I think, is like in the room here. Uh, we're all dealing with farmers, as I said, uh, you know, at the uh, commencement of this, and uh, I think our job is to try and help them, try and assist them, put ideas in front of them. And very often, in my experience, people who pick up, and even uh, myself in my own life, uh, you know, to someone who planted an idea in my mind because they knew me well or something, and I followed up on it, and it ended up being fantastic. So really. I think be trying to be conscious of planting good ideas in people's minds that might help them and give them to think about it and maybe get them educated in it. And I think, you know, it's important, I think, that uh, as professionals we do that. So uh, with that, thank you very much, Mr Chairman.